So this morning we were lucky enough to hear from quite a wide variety of clinician scientists to see what they do in their daily life and in their career. And over lunch we were able to hear from the perspectives of the different research institutes around Melbourne and the three universities. This morning we talked a little bit about the kind of skills that clinician scientists need. We touched on them. Structuring the right question, presenting at conferences both nationally and internationally, and writing up papers for publication. And now we're going to delve a little bit deeper into these areas. We're lucky enough to have with us Professor Ronaldo Bolomo, who's been regarded as one of the world's most, most influential scientific minds of our time, and he'll be telling us about how to structure a research question. Following this, Professor Christopher Fairley from the Melbourne Sexual Health Centre will be talking about how to write a good paper. And then finally, Stephen Jane will tell us about how to give a great talk. So to begin with, Professor Ronaldo Bolomo, who gave an excellent speech last year at Life as a Clinician Scientist, and I'm sure we've got another great speech to look forward to today. So welcome, Ronaldo. Thank you very much. And you're thinking about all sorts of things that have got nothing to do with research, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your digestive system. So I'm going to get you going with uh, a few fun slides and a little bit of information, a little bit of discussion, and a little bit of a different perspective. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to make you think a little bit. I'm going to try to make you smile a little bit. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit about building a research question. And then I'm going to philosophize a little bit some more and then make you smile, hopefully, and then explain how to build a research question and so on and so forth. So philosophy, the biggest problem with research questions is that people only think within the square. So and that's John Maynard Keynes, a famous economist, Nobel Prize, saying, look, the problem is not having new ideas. You can't get rid of the old ones. Can't get rid of the old ones. That's true of me, that's true of everyone else, and it's going to be true of you for the rest of your lives. So a little bit of philosophy, think outside the box. The other thing is there is academia against you. So anytime you're able to extricate yourself from the old ideas, you come up with new ideas, there are the old guys like me, right? Max Planck, Nobel Prize in Physics at the turn of the century. You never get there until the old fogies die because they'll be opposing you all the time. And then you have a new generation of guys that think that all the things that you said at the beginning about 30 years ago are actually true. And then it's OK. Now you can do, can do research. And whilst that's important, it's also important not to be too far ahead of the times. Uh, as you might know, if you're about 2,000 years ahead of your time, you get crucified. That's a bad outcome. I'm sure you don't want that. If you're about 100 years ahead of your time, like Galileo, incarceration and inquisition, are available to deal with you. If you're about 30 years ahead of your time, people will laugh at your ideas. I think you're crazy. Yeah, 10 years is looking pretty good. They're kind of like, yeah, well, maybe that's an interesting idea. A little bit of polite curiosity, which, if things work out, might turn into, gee, he really was ahead of his times. Five years, there'll probably be some hostility. Two or three years, you're just about right. So what you need to do unless you just want to have academic success but no meaning and no lasting effect. You want to have a combination of aspects to whatever you do. So there is some new stuff that is two or three years ahead of its time, but also some stuff that's a little bit more ahead of its times. <laughs> so I have a daughter. She is 24 now. But when she was 16, she got her first boyfriend. And you know, my wife, being a mother, she's very worried. And said, so, what, what, what's this guy like? You know, she hasn't said anything. And I pulled out this photograph, and I said, that's the guy. And she said, hell no. <laughs> and I said, what if she, you know, continued to go out with this guy and wanted to marry him? And she said, no way, no way. And that's, of course, me when I was <laughs> when I was 17. And I said to my wife, whoops, <laughs> you made a bad choice. You married this guy. <laughs> and, and that's to show you that there is an evolution in the way you are as a person, as well as in the way that you are as a researcher, as well as in the way you set your questions. You know, that's 11 years later as a resident. And you will see that the ravages of time have made my hair fall out 
have created wrinkles everywhere. But the passion for research was there. Okay, my first paper was in 1984. It seems like a lifetime ago. You probably weren't even born then, right? But it is an indication, as I hope for most of you, that that flame was burning from the very start. And it must not be allowed to be quenched if it does, un if it does exist in you. So given you've got passion, given that you're young, given that you don't look like I looked when I was 17, most of you look pretty nicely scrubbed up, how do you set a question? How do you prepare a question for research? And the answer is you can't do it. Not because you're evil, not because you're stupid, is that to actually understand all of the literature, all that's worthy of asking, the difficulties of conducting a particular project, the resources available, what is contextual, what matters now, what will matter in two or three years' time, you just can't do it. I spent 30 years doing it. So what you want is you need to find someone to help you. You need to find someone who can tell you and work with you and explain to you what is real and what is surreal, what is bullshit and what we need to bring down from bullshit half-believed status into being shown to be wrong or perhaps to be kind of partly right. So you need someone. And that's because clinical research is very, very complex. And there are all sorts of difficulties in understanding it and appreciating it. And it doesn't work like that. The real stuff is much more complicated than you think. You watch the news and hey, great discovery, great breakthrough. No, 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 it doesn't happen. It's constant and relentless frustration. So where are these people? Who are these people that we want to go and talk to that will help us or will help you decide what you need to do? Who are they? They are the mentors. They are people that are available. And there are lots of people in Melbourne that operate within structures. They've got great experience. They've done clinical research. They are very busy. They're very productive. They've got resources. They can bring you in and can help you select the question. So use them. You've got to get them, right? Well, where are these people, for God's sake? Right? Not under a mushroom. They are in universities, in hospitals, in industry. Or you can find them on Medline. I mean, you're the electronic generation, right? Go, Melbourne, diabetes, poof. <laughs> right? Have a look. See what it's, what's going on, right? Elif, Ekinji, yeah, OK, yeah. What's she doing? Oh, now that looks really good. Or, nah, no, nah, I don't want to do that kind of stuff. You know, and, and then contact people. You've got the social media, got the ability to, to kind of uh, interact with these people. People are, these people are people that have a passion, but many of us also look after patients. There are, there are physicians, there are surgeons, there are pediatricians, there are gynecologists, all sorts of people, and even intensive care doctors like me. We're kind of different from what you might think. You know, that's kind of what it looks like on the soapies, or some guy's sleeping. I don't know why they think that's intensive care. Uh, that, <laughs> but that seems to be the case in all the TV shows. I say to my wife, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> never mind. So the unconscious patient, you think, well, you know, who's taking the airway under control? Anyway, and, you know, and we do not only the clinical work, but also we're researching an area that is moving and changing because of technology all of the time, and it's incredibly challenging. And as always say, intensivists are like ducks. As you can see there, you know, the dog wishes it could fly, the fish would like to walk, the, the little bird would like to swim, but the ducks can do all of it and be happy. So why do you pick a mentor? There are a million ways. Sometimes it's a chance discussion. Sometimes you went to a presentation you really liked. Sometimes it's a particular field that you're interested in. So it's not the person, it's the field. And you've had you know, uh, tutorials, or you've been to meetings, or you've been to lessons, and you think, oh, that's really good. Or you've heard something about it. You've, you've seen it in the news. You've, you've heard somebody speak about it. Or you've done a scholarly selective, and that's allowed you to kind of get to experience something in a particular field. All of these avenues are totally legitimate. Well, how do you know you can work with these old people? How do you know you can work with these old people? I mean, there's a generation sometimes, sometimes they're younger, but there is a difference in age. How do you know it's going to work out for you? Well, you get to know them. You have to get to know because the most important thing to do is to get along with people, to be on the same wavelength. For example, I'm manic, and so if I have 
somebody wants to come and do some work with me, and they're kind of really, you know, a bit introverted, a bit quiet. Oh, I have a problem, <laughs> right? And so then it becomes a problem for the two of us because I can't quite communicate quite on the same wavelength. And that's not a problem because that person or I am bad. It's just that there is a wavelength issue. So if you meet somebody, then you're able to make an intuitive judgment as to whether you can get along with that person. Read some of what they do, meet them. They'll be always, my door is always open. I imagine that everyone else's door would always be open. You can go in, you can spend 15, 20 minutes, have a chat, get to know them a little bit and make those judgments. But the important thing is that whatever you want to do, you have to be part of a team because to do world-class research, you cannot do it on your own. You can't just wake up and go in the garage and try to do all these things in biochemistry or, or uh, genetics. You have to be part of a team. And only the team that you are potentially going to be working with know what the resources are, what can be done, where it can be done fast enough, because many of you have a time frame. It might be a year, it might be three years or four years for a PhD. Can it be achieved? Because they know what can be done, because they've been doing it for 15, 20, 25, 30 years. You cannot possibly know. And they know whether it matters or it doesn't matter, and whether it will sell out there or have an impact, or whether it will not have an impact. And they'll also know how to present the work that you do, how to make it interesting, how to make it impactful, because that's the business they're in, right? This will not be a sea panda. So just to give you a practical example, is a medical student uh, uh, from last year. He came to our research team about two years earlier. He just wanted to see what it was like. He was interested. Um, we spent a few weeks together in the summer. We had fun. He liked the team. We liked him. He was kind of an extroverted kind of guy. We worked on a couple of projects together. We kind of worked on a couple of papers together. And you could see, you could see the guy enjoyed the stage. Right? I enjoy kind of being in front of people with a microphone, you know, a little bit of an ego trip, and it's great. You want people like that. That's really good, right? Because, because, because intelligence without ambition, to quote again, is like an airplane without wings. You need that kind of lift. You need that kind of drive. It just is so. And then he said, well, can I do a BMED science with us? And we said, yeah, sure. And then we talked about what could be done and what he was interested in. And, we became interested in the effect of carbon dioxide and the administration of carbon dioxide, uh, the, the, the therapeutic uh, target of carbon dioxide being raised in order to maintain cerebral oxygenation. We had some preliminary data. We talked about how long that would take to do research. We showed them some of the work that we'd done on the effects of raising CO2 in patients after cardiac arrest. We had preliminary information that this was likely to have an impact, that this was likely to have an effect on cerebral oxygenation. Then we said, there is one thing about this, though, that you need to be aware. This is the rule in our office. It's posted in our team office. You're going to work your butt off. You're ready because if you think you can come in and just kind of like, yeah, everything will be fine. Guys, can you do that for me? Guys, can you do it? No, it's not going to happen. <laughs> so this is really important. And then we discussed how should we do it, what can we do, which patients, how can we get six patients, their patients fast enough, how do we assess biological efficacy, how do we assess clinical meaning, what resources do we need. All of that information, you need to work with a team. You need to work with a mentor. You need to work with somebody that does this all the time. What kind of study should we do? Of course, it doesn't look like a zap, and all of a sudden, you can work out what you should do. It doesn't work that way. So what we said, you no, know, we don't like doing observational studies. Observational studies are in the news all the time. You know, Drinking coffee stops cancer. Drinking coffee causes cancer. Eating chocolate makes you less depressed or more depressed. Having an apple a day stops dental caries. They're all bullshit, right? And so we have a problem with them because they generate random information. Uh, and observational studies in the 17th century, um, as you can see, they have promoted rectal insufflation for the resuscitation of patients that were unconscious. So we, we've actually moved up a little bit. The, the orifice has moved up, so we, we're using the, the top one. Uh, but pretty much the rest hasn't changed very much. Okay, 
So we decided, okay, together, I think we need a, a group of people that are predictable, they'll come through, we know that they're there, they come through quickly, do about 10 a week. Let's take people with cardiac surgery. Why? Because during cardiopulmonary bypass, they have a form of decreased cerebral perfusion because they lose pulsatility. That would be great, and we can look at these people as a population that has some similarities with the cardiac arrest patients. We can give them a higher CO2. We can deliver ways of assessing the consequences of that biochemically, biologically, and also by um, looking at their cognitive performance. We just need to get the other guys who play the game to be happy with us. That's my job, and I get the surgeons to to go away and let us do what we want, and the anesthetists to be happy, which I usually are, and then you need to do all of this. And that's a lot of work, right? And you need to do it ahead of time, because if you're gonna start a project, say on the 10th of February, you need to have thought about all of this, even though you're studying, you're doing something else, you need to prepare for it. You need to get ethics approval, you need to prepare all of these aspects of what you're going to do together with the team six months before you might take your year off to do a Bachelor of Medical Science. Because if you don't do anything to prepare it, when you arrive there, it will take you three months to get through ethics, and before you know it, you can't do anything, and it's all finished. So planning ahead, working with people, preparing, finding a mentor, it's something you're gonna have to start a year before you go and do whatever it is that you might choose to do. So this is called Planning ahead, and you won't, I'm sure you've heard this. Failing to plan is planning to fail, and you've heard that a million times before. And you've got to get the right control group. All right, very good. So, and then you have to build the question. And, and the question that typically, you know, young researchers come up with is like the, the ultimate, pivotal, final, life-saving question. It doesn't work that way. You can't do it that way. It has to be very specific. You've got to have a very specific question, a very specific measure of the outcome, a very specific outcome. It's got to be quantitative. It's got to be verifiable. It's got to be reproducible. And it's got to be assessable by statistical analysis. And the questions become much tighter when you work with the team, right? A secondary question, the same thing. You actually have to formulate the questions in a way that can specifically, correctly, and fairly be addressed, and so on and so forth. Now, some questions are very complex, and they cannot be addressed in human beings. Uh, you can resort to Babe. That's Babe's mom, I think. And you can do animal experiments, and they can be incredibly complex, and there's a blood purification technology, but they are very interesting, and they've got significant repercussions about what we do in human beings. Intensive care is incredibly complex and incredibly technological. You can even put animals on bypass, as a sheep on cardiopulmonary bypass. So all of those options are potentially available for that kind of research. But it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. <laughs> OK, it's a lot of work. And it requires a lot of commitment. It requires a lot of planning. It requires a lot of discussion. It requires working with the team. But let me argue with you that these are all the characteristics of a successful doctor. You've got to work with a team. You've got to plan. You've got to follow through. You've got to work very hard. You've got to get along with people. You've got to communicate. You've got to be collegial. You've got to be constructive. You've got to be diligent. You've got to remember what you're supposed to do. If you can't do it, you've got to let people know that you can't do it, and so on and so forth. This is training ground for being a good doctor. And also, Research often drives you in a particular direction, and you realize that your initial insights and your initial ideas are wrong. And very often, the biggest problem is that people have a closed mind, and they think, we already know this. We don't have to test it. It's already known. But in the immortal words of Mark Twain, that just ain't so. So why are we doing this? I mean, what's a cosmic question here? Why, why are we doing this? It's hard, it's a lot of work, you're on a bicycle on fire or whatever it is if you're a fella. It's a lot of pain, a lot of work. Because the alternative is horrible. The alternative is horrible. This is the world. This is Brexit, Donald Trump, <laughs> ideology, right? Where the world 
follows not data, not information, not control information, not outcome-based information, just endless, totally insane, it popped in my head, ideology. This is the alternative to research. It's monstrous. It has led to Stalin, Hitler, everyone else. It's a disaster. And this is the big, and you, you're a warrior in the biggest battle of mankind. The, the, the eternal battle between evidence and prejudice, which continues unabated every day in the media, uh, in the public arena, everywhere. It's endless. Please join the fight. It doesn't mean you have to be serious. You can be silly, you can joke, you can laugh, you can make things right, you can make things wrong, but you can be happy, you'll make mistakes, but then mistakes are really helpful. They allow you to understand what it is that you've got wrong. And of course, the most important thing is to put Australia where it belongs, <laughs> on top of everywhere else. There are other aspects that are really important. It's about who you are as a person. Because this will teach you that forever you want to pursue the truth, you want to pursue evidence, and you want to pursue excellence. And the pursuit of excellence in of itself has rewards that are fundamental. This is just, again, an example of another study that I did with Patrick, one of the medical students two years ago. It resulted in, in two papers, an abstract presentation, and, and it was a lovely email that he sent me uh, from Townsville, um, where he was with Monash Medical School saying, hey, we're the, we had a great time. Uh, it was great to submit the paper. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy. Everything is good. And we've helped create a more mature, fun-loving, although the clothing is a bit uh, problematic, uh, <laughs> young man. So let me finish one with a quotation from uh, Tennyson's poem, Ulysses. Even when you get to my age, even when you get to my age, this is true, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. The passion never stops. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ronaldo. That was an excellent end to your presentation. Are there any questions from the audience? Okay, that's a very good question from Ingrid. So, what, what would I do differently uh, in my life? This is a very difficult question because the way memory works in our minds is through editing, isn't it? So we transform all of our experiences in order to justify who we are and what we do and in order to logically explain how we got to be where we are and why it was a good thing that we did, whatever the hell it was that we did. And so it's all distorted. Nonetheless, taking into account all those biases and everything else, uh, what I would have done differently is pushed harder, I think, when I was a medical student. Because I remember distinctly going, so I want to do research. And, and the professor went, no, you're, coming, you're a fourth year medical school. Come on. You're like, for good, uh, come, j just learn medicine. And I remember thinking, I've already done that. Can I please do research now? Uh, and so I, I think I would have pushed harder. But then having said that, I was a young guy and, you know, and all of that kind of stuff, uh, you don't really realize that you can do that and you can be, you, you can succeed in breaking barriers by being determined. You learn it a little bit, well, I learned it a little bit later on. And then, and then once I worked it out, Whoa, okay, I was never going to stop. Once I worked out that if you just pushed, sooner or later the door would go down, then I was just going to push and push. It'll take me a year, it's okay, two years, that's okay, three years, I'm going to bring the door down. And that's something that perhaps you even learn from your failures. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. You mentioned that. The good researcher needs to have plan B. So how you prepare plan B? How do you prepare? Plan B, if plan the things B. didn't work. Okay. Again, you have to work with your team. 
your team will always have plan B because they know that about 20 to 30 percent of research projects that start out with a specific idea, however informed it is, however prepared by previous observation might be, will not succeed. Like you, you, you will not be able to find the patients you thought you had. There'll be some kind of glitch that some stops it from happening. So there's always going to be a plan B. In fact, there's always going to be a plan C. And so you, you prepare that with your team because it's very difficult for you to know, to have the experience that the team has about the things that will go wrong. And so, but you must always have it. And, and it must be discussed ahead of time because you have typically at your age, I mean, at my, my time constant is potentially 10 years or something like that. But in your age, when you start in this process, you've got a time constant of maybe a year and you need to kind of produce something that period of time. And so it needs to be made sure that you can. Um, I've got a question. Sorry. Yeah, sure. um, when we're making decisions that will direct our career, how do you know that you're making the right decision for you? You do not, do not know. Well, let, let me just say, do you have a boyfriend? Yeah. I do you know he's the right guy? I don't. <laughs> so, so here's the thing. All the important decisions you make in life are based on intuition. And some of them you'll get wrong. And then you will be tested for your resilience. That cannot be avoided. So that's just another important decision you will make. You gather all of the information that you've got, right? And all the information you can. You speak widely. But at some point, you've got to do this. Because... The, the alternative is immobility. And I can guarantee you that's worse. Can guarantee you. So I hope that answers it. Ronaldo. Ronaldo, that's a great talk, uh, having had sort of same experiences. So can I just ask you something uh, provocative, and that is the supervisor and the team that you need to avoid, yeah. the, the, the team and the supervisor from hell. Yeah. So, so we, we, we've, got, we've got a little thing in our office amongst all the little bits of sayings. One is called the no asshole rule. And it says that no asshole can enter the office because they're toxic. So you've got to be really um, informed about the character of the person as well as their academic achievement. How are you going to find that out? Just ask people. Ask people that might have worked with that person before. Ask people that know that person. Uh, and meet that person. Get a sense of, hmm, I'm not sure. Mm, there's something not quite right. So get all that information. Can, can you get it right all the time? I don't think so. But can you get it right about 90% of the time? I think so. And what happens if you get it wrong? Well, th then... You've got to have the ability to say, this hasn't worked out, and I'm getting out. And, and most, most universities will allow you to move to another person or another project. Now, you'll be behind, it'll be difficult, you'll be challenged, and it will be so on and so forth. But there'll be a lot of people that will help you. The good guys will, help, will understand and say, okay, let me, let me help you. But of course, there is the other version. There is the young researcher from hell problem as well. Thanks very much, Renato. It's a, it's a beautiful talk. <laughs> so next up we have Professor Christopher Fairley, and so he'll be telling us about how to write a good paper. Great. Well, thanks very much for the opportunity to come and speak about this. I'm going to try and tell you two things. The, the, the first is how to position yourself to get a paper written. I can't in 10 minutes tell you how to write a paper, but I'll tell you how to position yourself. And then I'll tell you about something I got really excited about. So the first thing is you have to ask yourself, why is it important to do it? Why do you want a paper? And let me tell you, it's much harder to get resident jobs and training programs than it was in our day. And papers make a huge difference. And they also make a difference to position yourself from a clinical job into a job that has some science associated with it too. So um, papers are a bit like 
money. They asked Rockefeller how much was enough. And he said, just a little bit more. Papers are a bit like that. How many papers are enough? Just a few more. So I think that it's unethical if you've done the work not to publish it. It's an incredibly valuable skill to learn. And it helps you to think something that medicine doesn't. Medicine's a lot about memory and not so much about thinking. So this is how you find a supervisor. And a lot of what I've said is similar to what Ronaldo mentioned. They've got to publish a lot. So if you want to write a paper, you've got to find someone who's published a lot of papers. It's easy to do. You can just do a medline like that, and you'll come up with how many papers they've published. How many must they have published? I, I'd be a bit anxious about someone who published less than 50, but it's that sort of number. You want to get at least to that level. The next thing is they've got to be a good supervisor. There's a big difference between a good researcher and a good supervisor. They've actually got to care about you and your career and your life as an individual. So what, what I do is I send them my CV and I say, you look up any students on there, here's my uh, assistant's name, you give him a call and you talk to any of those students. And if they give a bad report, I won't hear back from them and if they give a good report, I do. And the final thing is, you've got to make sure that the project that you're going to publish, you can visualise. Can you actually see this paper, the aim and the objective and so forth. It's got to be something clearly defined in the context. Quite different if it's a summer project, if it's a year-long BMED sci, or if it's a PhD. So you actually don't have to be any good at English. So uh, I'm quite dyslexic. This is my year seven school report. You'll see I've got 24% for English. I've got 29% for French and 47% for Latin. And in those days, they used to hand the marks out from the top to the bottom, and I was got the last one, and I got my last one back, and I looked at it, and the teacher made a problem with the mathematics. It was a half and a half made one, not a half, because I got a half out of 30, not one. So I went up to him and I said, um, look, I'm sorry, sir, Richard made a mistake. A half and a half make one, not a half. And he said, C has an announcement to make. In those days at school, everybody got called by their surname. No one got called by their first name. And I was a twin. So I couldn't get called by my surname because there were two of us. So I got the first, letter of my, the, the first letter of my first name, which is Christopher. So I got called C. But I think actually that, that constant failure was a very valuable experience because the next thing you have to ask yourself about writing a paper is can you take failure? Because unlike medicine where patients say, Thank you, doctor. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, doctor. They bring you a bottle of wine. They're really nice to you. It's not at all like that. When you get the reviews back on your, your paper, you have to be quite tough. It's quite, quite different. And the next thing you have to ask yourself before you start, and my mother said, never start something you're not going to finish, and it's certainly true here, is are you going to see it through? Because it takes a lot to see from the start to the paper through, and the people who publish a lot are the people who never give up on that, they keep seeing things through. I just ask you to be honest with yourself about that. Are you someone who can finish things? Because if you're not, if you're just going to go and play around for a while, there's probably no point, and people might get a bit irritated at you. The next thing I think you should notice is a bit of luck. So when I was doing my postdoc in London, we had this thing called Operation Churnout. So there was an Irishman, an Englishman, an American, and myself, and, and there was this huge database that the English weren't analysing. So we went from idea to submitted paper in 48 hours. We sent it off to this particular journal. And we waited and we waited and we waited. It didn't come back. So we wrote to them and said, what's happened to our paper? They said, oh, we've lost it. So we sent it in again. And about two weeks later, we got a letter back rejecting it outright. Oh, well, that's bad luck. These things happen. And we sent it off to another journal. And then about two weeks later, we got a letter back again accepting it. So the same paper had gone to the same journal, they hadn't lost it, and once it had been accepted and once it had been rejected. So there's a lot of luck in life. I've got a few golden rules about getting a paper published. Never give up. Believe me, you can publish almost anything if you're persistent enough. Make sure it's brief, because brevity is really important. People don't want to read, read, not get to the point. Make sure it's as clear as possible now I've got a rule about, about rejections. So what proportion of papers should you aim to have rejected by the first journal? So you'll all think, oh, I want to get them all accepted by the first journal. Well, if you do, if you're down this end, then you're not sending your papers to a good enough journal. Because otherwise, and if you're a little bit arrogant and you're getting 80% of your papers rejected, 
then you're sending them to too good a journal. The best use of time is somewhere in the middle here, about 30 to 50 per cent. So you should expect rejections. It's what happens. Now, I'm told at home I'm not very good at this one. But, so I looked it up. Empathy is being aware of, understanding, sensitive to the feelings and thoughts of another person. So you've got to get inside an editor's head because the editors really matter. So when your paper's going off, think about what's going on inside their head. They are really busy people. They're not looking for work. They're a bit narcissistic. They do want a slightly better world. So you've got to try and make it easy for them. So, so when you're looking at your paper before you're seeing it off, think through some of these things. This is what they're going to look at. They're going to look at your abstract. They're going to go to the first paragraph of the discussion because this says summarises everything. They're going to go to the tables and the figures and the letter to the editor. So don't have a whole lot of abbreviations and so forth. Make sure each of those stand alone so that grumpy, tired, half-drunk editor can get the message very quickly. In 60 seconds, this is what they've got to get out of your paper. And if they can't, and it's a good journal, I'd probably just reject it. And I'll say something like, not sufficiently novel for the journal. What did you do? Make it sound important. What did you find? Make it sound useful and really important, make it sound believable. How does it fit in with the existing information? Make it sound like it materially adds something useful. And this is my favourite book. I don't have many favourite books because I don't read very slowly, but this is one of my favourite books. It said, vigorous writing is concise. The sentence should contain no unnecessary words, a paragraph, no unnecessary sentences, for the same reason that a drawing should contain no unnecessary lines and a, a machine, no unnecessary parts. This requires not that the writer make all his sentences short or that he avoid all detail and treat his subjects in only an outline, but every word tells. So it's nice and simple and clear. So here are some key features of a clear paper. It's as readable as possible. It avoids clustered adjectives. So just look at that. HIV immune clients, clients immune to HIV. Just put a simple to in or an at or something like that. Never use while or though first, because you have to remember the first bit of the, the sentence before you get to the most important part. Use active words. Same order. So don't say men, A, B, C, women, C, B, A, etc. Avoid all imprecise words and avoid double negatives. So these are really important resources. This was written 20 years ago now. It's how to write a discussion, and it's really useful. This is how to write your paper, and this is something about the clarity of English. So now I've told you about how to write a paper and some resources for it. I'm going to tell you something that, that really excites me. It's about solving puzzles. So just before I start, these are the differences in my mind between medicine. Medicine is about what's the diagnosis, it's a set of rules, high MCV, order of B12, dementia, order of syphilis test. It's opinions based on others' work. I personally, at the end of my clinical training in ID, found it really boring and a bit repetitive and I wanted something more out of my career. So science is more about solving a puzzle, it's not based on rules, it doesn't require meds memory, thank God it doesn't require spelling, it requires logic and problem solving. So I'm going to give some background information before I give you the question you've got to solve. Sexually transmitted infections always occur for a reason. So here's infectious syphilis by the last 100 years in the UK, men in blue, women in pink. So war, sex workers, men not wanting to die, virgins and so forth, partner number go up, up it goes. Antibiotics come in, shorten the duration of infectiousness, plummets down, never got up again for women. Sexual revolution, stonewall riots, partner numbers go up. HIV comes along, partner numbers go down, syphilis disappear, and it's reoccurred more recently as the treatments got better. So things always happen for a reason. Here's the problem. Gonorrhea in Australia is climbing very dramatically, particularly, really only in gay men. And people say, oh, it's because people aren't using condoms as much. But, but remember, the rise occurred here, and this is the proportion of sexual acts with condomless anal sex with casual partners. It's been relatively stable over that time. So really, do you really think that sort of fourfold rise is due just to that? So here's the puzzle. That's the background. Why is gonorrhea 
so much more common in young gay men, but chlamydia or syphilis or warts are not. So these are all the same sexual acts, remember. It's just one infection is concentrating in young gay men and the others are not. So here's some data. So this is, this is throat gonorrhea and anal gonorrhea. 12% down to 3%, 25 to greater than 55. Same with anal gonorrhea, flat for chlamydia, flat for uh, urethral uh, chlamydia as well. So, so there's a reason for this. These things don't happen. There's, a, there's an explanation for it. Why? So I, I've spoken about this in the last year or so. Everybody says, oh, kid, it's, it's oral sex. You know, the, the young people have more oral sex than, than older gay men, so that's what it's due to. So I, I looked this up. It's quite hard to find this sort of fine detail. It's nonsense. They don't. This is 18 to 24, greater than 60. They have exactly the same amount of oral sex. They've got nothing to do with oral sex. It can't be receptive anal intercourse for throat gonorrhea. So kissing changes. So, oh, so perhaps it's related to kissing. Now, I tried to look up kissing without sex. I couldn't find it anywhere. I, you do that search, it won't come up anywhere. So that we, we had an uh, administrator who, she and her husband went to a party of a gay man who turned 40. And she said that her husband got quite disturbed because all the men at the party started to kiss one another. And I said, you mean kissing without having sex? She said, yeah, they're just kissing one another. Really? I thought, well, perhaps this has got something behind it all. So we had a medical student who told me about this particular club, which is a dancing club. And I said, uh, <laughs> tell me, when, you, when people go there, do they kiss? Oh, yeah, yeah, they, they just kiss all the time. You mean more than one person? No, there are lots of people. I said, would you mind going there one night with a pad? <laughs> and, and could you follow a few people around and count how many people they kiss? He said, no, kid, no. <laughs> I won't do that for you. <laughs> but I will tell you that I buddied a friend of mine who took ecstasy for the first time and he kissed 17 men without having sex with them. So nobody knows how common this is, kissing without sex. And it might be really important because it might have the control to, to gonorrhea. So we did it. The men coming to our clinic, we asked them, in the last three months, how many partners have you had that you kissed only and not had sex, proper kiss, and how many you had sex with? <laughs> And you'll see it's about the same. Nobody knows this. This information is not known anywhere in the world. Just recently we've published it. So this might be driving. But if this is going to explain what's happening with the age, it's got to be more common. This has got to be more common in younger gay men. Well, look at that. These are not big differences, 25 to 35, and it halves. And sex without kissing rises. So, so this might be the answer to the explanation for why gonorrhea is so different to all other sexually transmitted infections. It might relate to kissing. So if you read all the textbooks about sexually transmitted infections, this is what they'll tell you. Infected person here, partner here, the mouth gives it to the penis, the anus gives it to the penis, the penis gives it to the mouth and to the anus. Well, that hasn't got kissing in it. And kissing must be in it somewhere. So I drew, redrew the diagram. So I said, well, what if we do this? Everyone just thinks I'm a complete idiot. What if kissing is transmitting gonorrhea this way and also saliva use, which is used frequently as a lubricant for anal sex, what if that is transmitting it there as well, which would explain those graphs that I first showed you? Now, everybody at the meetings thinks I'm completely nuts about this, but I think they're coming around. But, but just a minute, Neisseria meningitidis, not Neisseria gonorrhea, that's transmitted through kissing, so why wouldn't Neisseria gonorrhea be transmitted through kissing? So Lei Zhang, who works with us, for the first time ever, never been done before, was able to replicate the prevalence by sight of gonorrhea in the throat, anus and urethra. No one else has been able to do it. They can't get the urethral prevalence down to what it actually is because everybody thinks it's coming from the penis. The penis is just a not quite so innocent bystander that gets infected. <laughs> But it's not, it's not driving the infection. What's driving the infection is, is the throat. So everyone says, well, really, kid, really? No one's going to stop kissing. Now, I can, I can actually, we've done that study. We've asked people what they're prepared to stop. And you're quite right, they're not prepared to stop kissing. But perhaps they don't have to. What about if mouthwash, 
would shorten the duration of throat gonorrhea, which is normally about three months, and that at a population level, that might then drive the infection down. Well, Eric Chow here from our centre did that experiment. He took people in who came in with a positive throat swab. He gave them, list, he randomised them to Listerine or saline, and it halved the gonorrhea detection five minutes later. So this is one episode of mouthwash. So what I'm talking about is, is shortening the duration. I don't want Listerine to work every time. I just want to shorten the duration. So if Listerine used every day, shorten the duration down to 45 days rather than 100 days, what would be the effect of that at a population level on gonorrhea and go in? So Lay did the model. So this is the, the, without, without the intervention, without mouthwash. Look what happens when you get rid of, when you shorten the duration of pharyngeal gonorrhea from 90 days to 45 days. Now got a large NHMRC grant that Eric got, and about 60% recruited. Be able to tell you early next year the answer to this particular question of whether you use mouthwash for three months or not, you reduce your chance of catching throat gonorrhea. So this began by asking a question, just an observation: Why do young gay men get gonorrhea more commonly than chlamydia? And it's ended with a possible non-condom-based intervention for the control of gonorrhea in gay men. I must say, if this works, it's going to be one of my greatest privileges of a lifetime. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris. So I think Professor Fellow's talk really illustrated a couple of points Ronaldo was making about how important it is to really understand the context and the background to the area you're working in order to come up with the right research question. He was really able to do that and then sent his medical student out to do the surveys of Puftoff and how many men are kissing men there. <laughs> so are there any questions from the audience for Professor Fairley? Um, okay. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to show here? Holly, you have a question. When you sort of stumble across something that could really could be quite big like this. Do you ever get scared that someone else might be doing the same thing or uh, publish their paper before yours or anything? I, I think you. And so that certainly happened, but but there's nothing that beats being thorough. So if you can sort of think about, okay, so and it was one day I was at my desk and I didn't have much to do, and so I just got a piece of paper and I said, solve this puzzle, and I started to draw diagrams of penises and other things like that draw arrows between them and so forth. And then we got together for about half a day and we just planned this whole process of what studies do we need to do. We need to show that, first of all, you've got gonorrhea, you can grow it from saliva, and then the mouthwash, and then one thing and another. And then we need the mathematical model to support this and so forth. You do have to be in a hurry. You know, you do have to be a bit anxious. You do have to sort of be conscious. This is where, you know, you want to choose, um, you want to choose a greater success rate for the first publication. If you've got something that someone else can't replicate, that, that you're very safe, then you can go for, for a, a better journal. But something like this, sometimes you're better to get it in to a, in, into, a, into a journal that's going to take it first time around and get it, and get it going. So, yeah, that's, that's a reality. And people have been, you know, beaten all, all the time. I think this was such a wacko idea that <laughs> no one is really insane enough to have come up with the same sort of thought process. But, but I think, I just think we might be right. Uh, you know, there aren't many times in life when this sort of thing happens, but I think we might be right about this one. Okay. There's another question at the back. Um, first of all, thank you for your talk. It was very informative. Um, so my question is, how are you able to think so creatively and come up with such creative solutions? Let me warn you that uh, I was not born thinking clearly. I, I think, you know, logic runs more strongly in some families than, than others. But I, I uh, grew up in a family where you had to think logically about stuff. But when I first started this, I look back at some of the stuff I sent off and the logic was so flawed, I'm embarrassed to tell you about some of the things that, that we send off. So I, I, it, it is probably a training process that takes a good 10 years for it to happen. 
just like it takes 10 years to get a good doctor going, it probably takes you 10 years of logical, rational thinking to get it through. Some people find it easier than others. You know, I, I, I just love solving those sort of puzzles. I like to know the answer to the question. So uh, it's just a lot of reasonably hard work. If I can give you one thing, make sure you've got time. I think that uh, it was Keating that, that said, even as a Prime Minister who's really busy, you need time to think. Rudd never allowed himself any time to think, and look what happened there. So, so it is really important that you don't get too busy and you allocate time to think slowly and carefully about solving a particular puzzle. Um, I was just wondering, um, in terms of from a social perspective, because obviously there's quite a history with how gay men have been treated due to certain scientific discoveries, is that something you've sort of addressed in your research when you're focusing on gay men? I just missed the first bit of the question. Did you, can you repeat it or? Do you want to repeat the yeah, um, just from a social perspective, uh, in terms of making sure that you don't end up with stigma from your research. Yeah, that's a really, really important um, question. And, and I'm not gifted with um, picking up some of these things some, sometimes, you know. I, I need a bit of help sometimes to uh, pick up that. But, um, you know, I, so, so I think you've just got to word things. If you go back 30 years ago and look at the journals, they'll use words like promiscuous and too many partners and all that sort of jazz. And you fast forward to today, we, we, we uh, talk about um, sexual behaviour. I, I think that's a word that will go in the next... 10 years or so, because behaviour can be good or bad. So we, we write sexual practices now because practices can't necessarily be good or bad. And I think it's a really, really important question. I mean, I think that, uh, that gay men have got lots of stigma and people with HIV have got lots of stigma. And we try very, very hard to avoid doing anything we possibly can to, um, to, to, uh, to uh, enhance that. Um, I'll try and think of a good example in the meantime, but that one's not coming up at the moment. Great. Yeah, next question down the front. Um, just back to your research. Um, what do you think the active ingredient in the mouthwash is mm. that's killing the gonorrhea? That's a really good question, isn't it? Um, so, so I think that, uh, so we tried a lot of different mouthwashes in an experiment. We diluted them down. You could dilute them down to one in 32 and it still did it. Some don't work at all, some didn't work at all, and alcohol that they talk about being useful didn't work at all either. So, so we got someone to look through all the, you know, the 82 brands of mouthwash available in, the, in Australia, um, and some do work a lot better for gonorrhea than others, and there is an ingredient in it that I can't remember, it's, it starts with S. Words don't stick in my, uh, in my mind very well. Um, that, that we think's probably the ingredient, but, but it's very hard to know because there's probably half a dozen agents that have an antibacterial action in it. But um, in a way, it doesn't really matter. It works really, really well for any bacteria and it seems to work really well for, for this one. So we're not going to try and work out exactly what, what it is. And I don't want to tell you the name of the mouthwash we're trialling at the moment. <laughs> That'll come out in about six months or so. So, Professor Feli, you mentioned that when you first presented this work at international conferences, there was a bit of a hostile reaction to it. No one really believed what you were saying. Do you ever find that your work is rejected from journals based upon what you're talking about rather than the quality of the research? And how do you deal with that when it happens? Uh, I, th I think... So, first of all, I have to tell you that um, the niceness of a, a specialty is probably inversely proportional to its income capacity. So, so, so I think that, that in my area of sexual health, which is the lowest prestige and lowest um, income specialty of all, the people are actually very nice. So, so you, don't get, you don't get anyone being really unpleasant. In some specialties, and my wife works in rheumatology, they're really not nearly as nice as the, uh, as the sexual health people. So they haven't really been unpleasant to me, but they just, I think they think I'm wrong. But, but I think we were wise. We held back with presenting this information until we had crossed all the boxes and dotted all the I's. And I think actually, I think they think, oh, well, you know, perhaps he's right. But I still look at it and think, 
really? Can, can all these people have thought gonorrhea is transmitted this way for the last 50 years or 100 years or whatever, and suddenly you think you've got it right? Really? So I always ask myself that question. How can you possibly think that's the case? But actually, I do. On this occasion, I think we might be right. Okay. I would just have one last question from Ilya. Well, that really interesting presentation. I um, My question is along similar lines about that feeling of, OK, you, you feel like, yeah, they all think I'm crazy and, you know, how am I going to convince these people that this uh, could be the truth? Um, and about how you as a person deal with that. And I guess you highlighted to the fact that you're always questioning yourself. Um, I think you've got to be innately quite confident. Um, I, I, uh, I spent a lot of time at school getting uh, humiliated and so forth. So I think that probably strengthened my resolve to, to uh, you know, to think. My, my parents uh, were told um, that uh, by our first grade teacher that you have two of the most stupid children I've ever taught and you'll be lucky if they ever get into an apprenticeship. So I think um, some of that has probably made me innately more confident because I, I didn't believe that uh, those things were right. But, but I, I think sometimes things are so just bloody obvious that they're right, aren't they? I mean, I, I, I don't know if I've convinced you or not, but, but the penis is just not infected for long enough to give that amount of infection to the throat. It, it can't come from the penis. The, the penis gets gonorrhea, it gets symptomatic. Within seven days it's treated, you know, the throats just don't have that much contact with that many penises. I think I've worked it out. You'd have to have contact with 1,250 penises in a year <laughs> to, to generate that prevalence of infection. So sometimes you just think, oh, I think I'm right. <laughs> Some great take-home messages there. So our next speaker is Professor Stephen Jane, who initially completed his medical degree at Monash University and then went on to do basic physician training at the Alfred Hospital. He's now returned there to be the head of Central Clinical School and Professor of Medicine at Monash University and the Director of Research at Alfred Hospital. So really a great career path to follow. In between, he spent some time in America and I'm sure he'll tell you a little bit about that as well. And he's quite well known at Monash for his uh, engaging presentations to both medical students and to scientists at the Australian Centre for Blood Diseases. So we're really happy to hear him um, give, tell us about how to give a great talk. Thanks. <laughs> So I'll just start by saying, giving a talk, there's a lot of luck, like science and anything in your career. And the one thing you hope for when you give a talk is the two people who've talked before you have given lousy talks that have <laughs> bored the audience witless. So I'm pretty upset that I have to get up and follow the two talks that we've just had because clearly that hasn't set a very good stage for you. So the second problem I had was that when Ingrid asked me to give a talk, she said, we'd love to give 10 minutes on how to give a talk and then followed up with 10 minutes of science. And I thought, all right, I'll do the science part first, which I did. Then I wrote 10, the 10 minute talk on how to give a great talk. And then I realized that all the rules I'd set up in how to give a great talk, I'd broken in my scientific talk. <laughs> so I had to go back and rewrite the scientific talk. So I'll take you through uh, lessons that really have been learnt over a long period of time in public speaking. And I think the major thing to remember is you are never too good, too old, too experienced to learn. And I got that uh, when I came actually back to Monash. I'd been working at the Royal Melbourne for a long time. I hadn't actually lectured medical students uh, at a, at a um, uh, early stage of their career. I'd certainly done clinical teaching. But when I started at Monash, I was asked to give a lecture to a second year on um, red cell disorders. So I prepared my lecture and went out, gave the lecture. I was very happy with it. I got back and a week later my SETCHI scores arrived and they were just atrocious. Who is this guy? This was rubbish. We didn't understand a word he said. This was a ball. It was like I was horrified when I saw these scores. But I realised that I had pitched this at a level that was too high for the audience and I had to go back and think about it. So I did. I worked on it. I wasn't too proud. I went back. I read re-derived the lecture and then when I gave it subsequently my SETCHI scores have climbed and I've continued to look at the feedback to work on it. So I think that is important. It, some, some of you will have an innate talent to be able to get up and address an audience but even if you do I think you always have ability to learn from feedback uh, from what you've given before. So 
There's a whole lot of vogues in talking. One of the vogues that's come about recently is give an outline of the talk. So you start with a title and then you put four or five dot points of exactly what you're going to talk about. And that's like many things in fashion, as you can see from here, the Rolling Stones on the right and Andre Agassi on the left. These things come and go. So what looked fantastic in those days maybe doesn't look quite so good now. And I think this is very one of the aspects of giving a talk that is very much personal preference. Whether you want to actually didactically outline what you're going to talk about or not, I actually prefer to get straight into the talk and start giving uh, information about the topic. And this is probably the most important aspect. And I think the talks that we had prior to mine really illustrated that beautifully, that both of those speakers really made a concise statement about what they were trying to address. What is the topic? Define it clearly for the audience. What is the critical research or clinical research or basic research problem or question that you're trying to answer? What is the work you're proposing to try and address it? And what are the outcomes you might derive from that sort of re uh, research? And I thought, as I said, the previous talks did that extremely well. So assume no knowledge, and I couldn't think of a better slide than that one to illustrate that point. And one of my other speakers also uh, mentioned the current president. And that's not a bad idea, and that was a mistake I certainly made to the medical students, pitching too high. So it's not a bad idea to think that people aren't familiar with your topic, and I don't think it is wrong to pitch it a bit lower than you might expect. And that's a really critical part about giving a talk. What does the audience know? So obviously you're speaking to a room of haematologists, you don't have to introduce a red cell. But if you're speaking to a room of general physicians, then you might have to go into more detail about hematopoiesis or erythropoiesis than you would. So it's very important, and particularly I think the mistake people make is when they're speaking to a lay audience. It's a completely different mindset, and it's a mindset that you need to learn. And it's a mindset as a clinician you need to learn, because Patients want to hear what's going wrong with their mother, their father, their brother, whoever, in terms that they can understand. And so you need to take exactly that mindset into your talks when you're giving a lay talk about your research. You've got to pitch it such that somebody sitting in the audience knows what the hell you're talking about. Barry Firkin, who was my first mentor, was the first professor of medicine at uh, Alfred Hospital and still to this day was the finest clinician I ever worked with. Barry said, don't ever worry about a talk because when you have an audience of 100 people, remember only three people in the entire audience know more than you do and two of them are asleep. So I always thought that was a really good way to not get stressed, to not worry, to actually stand up there and think, I actually know more than most of these people. It's unlikely I'm going to get a question that's going to rattle me because I've researched, I've read the background, I understand my topic and I'm going to be able to talk about it. The next major thing to remember is to keep your SAR slides simple. So there's this burgeoning joy of trying to put every piece of information that you possibly can in the slide, and that's what you end up with. And so, of course, the entire room glazes over, lapses into coma, and has no idea what you say from that point onwards. So don't present slides like this. Keep them simple. Keep them diagrammatic. Make sure the points are illustrated clearly so people can follow what you're saying. Remember, most of them don't know the topic anywhere near as well as you do. And in keeping with that, think of your fonts, your figures, your colours. So it's pointless having something in 11 point because the person sitting up the back of the room isn't going to be able to see it. And similarly, colours like yellows, etc., which don't project. So you've got to think about who you're talking to, where, the, what size of the auditorium, what the lighting is going to be, and in general, try and get your colour schemes right such that they're not abhorrent to the eye and everybody's put up, off or distracted by them. Simple things, I know, but very important in talks, and I've been to many talks in major meetings from major speakers who presented stuff that half the room couldn't actually see the data or the font. Very important. So one of the key things I've always done with the talk is that every slide that you're putting up has a message to deliver. And I think the best way to give a talk is at the beginning of that slide, state that message. Then present the data in the slide, and then at the end of the slide, state the message again. And so 
The data in the middle, which is the complex part, is bracketed by the conclusion that you are trying to get across in the slide. And I've always stuck to that mantra, and I think it's a very good one, because if people miss it the first time, they get it the second time, but if they do get it the first time, then they're already starting to think about what the data presentation is going to look like. And the only thing is, obviously, you'd like the message to be the same at the beginning and at the end. So this, I think, for this room, this generation, this slide is very important. Don't <laughs> fall in love with gimmicks. You're all technophiles, you all love this stuff. And there's nothing worse than sitting in a talk with images popping in and out and flying and shattering and melting and, oh, my stars. Just keep it nice and simple because they're distracting. And what you want is somebody not to walk out of your talk and say, wow, did you see those graphics? Did you see the way all those images went? You actually want them to walk out and say, wow, that was a great talk, wonderful science. So just keep it simple, yeah? Uh, I think humour in talks is good, especially if it's funny. So I think it's, it's not a bad idea to try and inject something within the talk to keep the audience amused and light. Scientific talks, research talks are often fairly dense and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with presenting your data and presenting it thoroughly. But sometimes just having something within the slide to lighten it up isn't too bad. And uh, I love that one. Sorry, I slept in class when they covered your condition in medical school. Um, I think it's very important, and the previous speaker spoke about this, that you are actually standing in front of a room as a part of a team. Almost no research work these days is done by a single investigator. And you are standing there having the privilege to represent a group of people, most of whom have worked as hard as you have on a particular topic. And so you want to be giving. You want to be selfless in this setting and you want to make sure that you recognise the people who've made a contribution, no matter how small, to the work, because often they'll be in the audience, and I think when they see their name, they see that as a major reward for what they've done. And they may not have played as an important role as you have, but I think that selflessness is a really good quality in science and part of collaborative work. The other thing to do is make sure you mention your funders, because they're the ones who are providing you the money to do the work, Sometimes they'll also be sitting in the audience and they certainly like to recognise the fact that they've given you half a million dollars to do a particular body of uh, experiments and that that should be part of the equation. So the second half, I'm just going to talk about work uh, that I've done and I, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time in the detail of the science, just a little bit, but I wanted to present it because I think it illustrates a lot about what a research career looks like. So I started working on disorders of haemoglobin production, which are beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease, which are the beta chain disorders. And I started working on this about 27 years ago when I first went to the United States as a postdoc. That's a hell of a long time. And I think that's a really important thing to understand that the journey is sometimes incredibly long. And it's not that nothing happens over that period of time, you make incremental advances along the way and then maybe, if you're lucky, at some time or other, there's a eureka moment that you've worked towards all your life. But lots of people never have that. They walk away from their careers with all of those increments and never ever have that moment that changes everything. Somebody else in the future uses work they've done to create that. And that's fine. And it's something you have to understand in science. It's an incremental process. It's not necessarily about finding that a new mouthwash changes oral gonorrhea, which is going to completely rewrite the paradigm of how gonorrhea is transmitted. So, the disorders I've worked on are, by any world standard, remarkable. 10% of the entire global population carries a globin change disorder. 10%. One in every ten man, woman and child on this planet has a globin disorder. Staggering. And although relatively underrepresented in this country, although changing with uh, migration from Sudan and other areas, 
In the areas where these diseases are endemic, which is where malaria is endemic, they are catastrophic, predominantly because of lack of genetic counselling and availability for pregnancy termination and also lack of a safe blood supply. So kids with beta thalassemia survive until they're four, obviously with no adult blood production and they die. And kids with sickle cell disease live an incredibly miserable 14 years before they die untreated. But even in the best treatment centres around the world, life expectancy for sickle cell disease is still only 42. So these... This is a schematic of the globin genes, uh, and I'm not going to labour this, but up the top of the genes that we make through development, and they're expressed in the order uh, in which they're, sorry, arrayed on the chromosome in which, the order in which they're expressed. And then the bottom graph is a graph called the Weatherallogram after Sir David Weatherall, who's one of the doyens of haemoglobin research. And it essentially just shows that during development, we initially make embryonic haemoglobin in the blue. We switch then to fetal haemoglobin, which we have all the way through gestation in our mother's stomach and then when we're born we switch again to the red haemoglobin which is adult haemoglobin and obviously it's the second of these switches the switch to adult haemoglobin where the catastrophe starts with thalassemia because you never make it or with sickle cell disease because you make it but it's broken amazingly we know that in about 0.0000000001% of patients who have thalassemia or sickle cell disease who co-inherit another mutation where this happens and the fetal haemoglobin gene, instead of switching off at birth as it does physiologically, remains on because of a mutation, these patients are cured. So it's sort of unusual in science where nature has basically wrapped it up, put a big bow on the top and handed it to you and said, here's the cure for thalassemia and sickle cell disease. All you have to do is to reactivate fetal haemoglobin expression in all the rest of the patients that don't have a natural mutation to do for them. And I can tell you there's probably been 200 labs around the world have been working on this problem for 40 years, despite the fact that we've known the answer all of that time. And I think that illustrates it's not an easy game. So if you want to go into science, you've got to think hard about it because you're going to be asked questions, personal questions about your determination and your resilience that you may never have been asked before, even in a difficult course like medicine. So, as I said, the cure is there. You only need about 20% of F. It's not a huge upregulation, but the body is an incredible organism. We have turned off the fetal haemoglobin. We lock it, we bolt it, we build the cage around it, we put iron bars in front of it, because when we regulate genes in the body, we regulate them for keeps. So tissue and temporal specificity of gene expression is incredibly stringent and it's very, very difficult to change a developmental program that's evolved over hundreds of millions of years. Nevertheless, we've been working on it for a long time and I always love this slide. I put it up, I talk about it for two minutes, it's 20 years work. <laughs> so essentially, this is what the fetal haemoglobin gene looks like and there's a whole cluster of factors and so on that assemble on the proximal promoter and essentially induce what are called epigenetic changes. And these are changes to the DNA or the histones that sit on the DNA that affect gene expression. And essentially, after an incredible period of time, we found one protein, which is shown here called PRMT5, which is an enzyme that seems to be a master key that's involved in setting up all of these silencing and repressive changes on fetal hemoglobin. And the beauty of PRMT5 is it's an enzyme. So we found a number of transcription factors that we thought were important for this. We'd gone to drug companies and said, we've got a target, this is great. They said, what is it? We said a transcription factor and they said, the door's over there. When we finally went to them with an enzyme, and because enzymes have active pockets, you can get little molecules in there to block their activity, we finally got a seat and they said, we're interested. And so we set about trying to find inhibitors of PRMT5 that we had shown in other experiments, if you block the activity of this particular enzyme, you could de-repress fetal haemoglobin and turn it back on again. So that's that data here. So this is uh, a blot showing PRMT5 being reduced and gamma globin up the top and you can see with the control which is SCR versus the knockdown that you see an increase in gamma globin. And not only that, you see a complete wiping of the DNA of DNA methylation marks and DNA methylation is a silencer of gene expression. So if you erase the DNA methylation, the genes all come on and you can achieve that by getting rid of PRMT5. 
So we set about doing a screen to find one of these little molecules to fit in that pocket to block it. And this is just the techniques we used. And these are our collaborators in Street and Paul Stuffel from the Weehi. And we found molecules. And just the top right graph shows how specific they are. That's the percent inhibition for this parent to five molecule. And this is all the other methyl transferases that we make. And you can see almost none of them are affected. And that's obviously important when you're using a drug, you don't want off-target effects to affect other molecules. So, having found this, we started looking at its activity, and at that time, drug companies started to knock on our door, and last year, we sold the licence for KRMT5 inhibitors to Merck for 515 million US dollars. So, I think a lot of you are seduced by the possibility of earning enormous money doing medicine, and that certainly is a philosophy, but just to tell you, there's a lot of money in research too, if you happen to get to the right answer but it only takes you 20 years longer to do it. So Merck is now developing this drug uh, for haemoglobin disorders, but also during the course of this work, a lot of other groups around the world were working on this enzyme PRMT5 and have shown that it's also a critical target in cancer, probably predominantly in blood cancers. And so we've now got great data suggesting that it's an, also an active drug in acute leukaemia that we're working towards. So from the globin viewpoint, uh, we're doing a preclinical trial in baboons because baboons have exactly the same haemoglobin switching pattern as humans and that's with David Kirst and Stefan Stondriga from the lab and we'll, we've already shown that administering the inhibitors for baboons leads to fetal haemoglobin activation and that is all we need to show the FDA to get this into trial in humans for sickle cell disease and thalassemia. So a 25 year journey has finally ended up with a compound that I can honestly say I can move now to clinical trial. It still could fall. It may not get there, but at least the major hurdle of getting into clinical trial has occurred. So just the people who helped with all the scientific work and our funders to show you that what I told you about giving a talk I try and stick to, and I would thank the organisers for the invitation to speak. But just finally, and this is a very important slide, I looked at uh, people who've spoken about giving good talks, and uh, somebody who's one of my heroes is Sir Justice Michael Kirby, who's an outstanding Australian. And he was giving a similar talk on boring speeches and he came up with this uh, uh, writing that in the old days of the Soviet Union, the Politburo people would get up and speak and they'd speak for long periods of time, basically. And the only relief from these talks was either recorded as applause, prolonged applause, or thunderous prolonged applause. And it was decided that you only got prolonged thunderous applause if you gave an absolutely rubbish talk because essentially everyone wanted to get up and stretch their arms and legs and get the blood flowing and so they all leapt to their feet. And so with that in mind, I would ask you to engage in thunderous <laughs> prolonged applause. Thank you. A very good way to get everyone to clap for you. So I think the selflessness you talked about was, is a really important part of giving a talk and I really like the way that you mention your collaborators both at the end but also throughout and give showing pictures of them alongside the work they've done. I think Stephen Tong did a really good job of that as well, mentioning a lot of the great work of his PhD students, many of whom are here today. So are there any questions for Professor Jane? So that's while we think of them. Um, you mentioned at the start that it's really important to think about who your audience is when you're pitching a talk and what level to pitch it at. When you've got a mixed audience, so some people who may know a lot about your field, some who may know a lot less, what level do you pitch at? Do you pitch at the lowest level or somewhere in the middle? Yep, I think you, out of respect to your audience, you pitch at the lowest common denominator, basically. So I think, I mean, you have to contextualise that. If, I mean, if you're at a specialty hematology meeting and there happens to be one member of the press there, then obviously that's not the case. But I think if it's truly a mixed population, and that happens often in a hospital situation, if you're giving grand round or something, that you'll have, you know, the head of a particular unit, but you'll also have, you know, other people who are not as familiar with your work who work in other medical units or allied health areas completely away from yours and so on. And I think out of respect to all the people who bother to come and hear you, you should make sure the person who's likely to know the least about your talk goes away with understanding what you've said. Okay. Are there any other questions for Professor Jane? I think the $500 million deal with Merck is pretty incredible. Um, it must have involved a lot of, I guess, patent paperwork and stuff like that. How did you find your role changing towards the end of your time, either 20 years discovering that? That's a really good question, actually. It's the sort of thing that you would love to make another discovery next week because you've made so many hideous mistakes about going through the process in the first iteration. You'd hope you'd be a lot better in the second. And it's, 
it's quite bizarre that universities generally, I think, are rubbish at commercialisation. And I don't hesitate saying that, and I say it to the people at the university. Uh, and I think it's just that we don't have enough throughput of really substantial discoveries. And I think that we've started to go around that by putting structures in place. So there's a new body called BioCurate, which is essentially going to be a commercialisation arm that both universities of, have invested in. And that particular body, I think, is going to have the necessary expertise to help people down this journey, because it's an arduous one, I can tell you. Mm, great. And then Ingrid, do you have a question? Yeah, Steve, that's fantastically exciting to hear that you've got to this point. Can you sort of think, I think you said 25 years to get to this point or something like that. Can you tell us what kept you going? Why bother along that way? Yeah, look, I think uh, Kit and, and previous speakers have said this, that I think it's a major change from medicine to science and that uh, I think was illustrated by the fact you know you do medicine every single day you go home at the end of the day and think I've made a positive contribution today because the patient puts a hand on yours and says thank you or you talk to the family and they appreciate the fact that you've given them information and so on you can spend weeks at the bench and seemingly get nowhere months sometimes sometimes years but that mindset you've got to learn that although you don't feel as you're making an advance, even by making a mistake and getting something wrong, you know not to go down that way again. So you go some other way. So it's not eureka moments, positive feedback all the time, but there are enough of those moments where you see, yeah, I'm actually getting closer, I'm moving towards it. And I think others have said you just need a ruthless determination. And I suppose the final thing is, you know, the rewards, the bigger picture rewards are phenomenal. I mean, the globin disorders are just absolutely miserable diseases. If anyone's looked after or seen patients, particularly with sickle cell disease, it's just a wretched disease with virtually no therapy. So that's a pretty good driver for you, you know, to know I want to keep going because if I do find something, it's going to make a major difference to an incredible number of people. And down the back, another question? On the topic of... On the topic of giving good talks and um, answering questions, have you ever um, been faced with a question that you really don't know how to answer? Like how, how if like being put on the spot, how would you address that? Thank you. Yeah, I've got a great story about that. So it was actually not long after I came back from the States and there was a Victorian government health initiative down at Lawn. And uh, I had been working in a lab that had been pursuing gene therapy for hemoglobin disorders. And gene therapy was still very new, and so the government asked me to come to this talk uh, to speak on gene therapy. So there were two problems with this talk. Context is one. So the person before me spoke about Aboriginal health and essentially said it's appalling, there are no resources, blah, blah, and gave a compelling talk about the plight of Aboriginal health in this country and the shame that we should all experience because of it, and it's under-resourcing. Then I had to stand up and talk about gene therapy, which the US government had just allocated $3 billion in the budget for, for the next calendar year. So the juxtaposition of those two talks wasn't lost upon me. But then I talked, I thought, I'm asked to do it, I'll do it. So I talked about gene therapy. I finished and somebody jumped to the feet at the back of the room and said, this is a disgrace, this is outrageous, I can't believe you would be here advocating this. And this was Sir Zelman Cowan, actually who said, you know, this is where the Nazis started, this is what's going to happen, we're going to start modifying the genome to alter phenotype, etc. So it was one of those situations where there was a question <laughs> that was very difficult to answer cogently without being insulting or disrespectful respectful to obviously a very important and senior Australian. So you do sometimes get a curveball from the audience that you're not expecting and I think that's part of the challenge of sciences and medicine to think on your feet to think, how can I answer this without being rude, without being disrespectful? And I suppose my argument to this was, well, if you look back at the history of human invention, many things that have been invented for the common good have been altered and used badly, but it doesn't mean that the original premise for which they are invented was negated in the first place. And that was how I answered that question. But it's a really good question. You will get curly ones occasionally. And any more questions from the audience? Yeah, just one more down here. Can we get a mic over? Ben? Yeah. Hi, 
Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I was just wondering if you had any advice regarding giving talks overseas to an audience that perhaps is not from an English first language background, and then how could one keep it simple and make it clear to a different culture, I guess? Yeah. I think one thing you'll find as you, as you have, you know, travel and do more, have more experience in that, that English is a, is a pretty well universally accepted scientific language. So I don't think I've ever been in a scientific situation, and I've spoken, you know, in many, many countries around the world uh, where I haven't been able to deliver uh, a talk in English and have a substantial majority at least of the audience completely understand. But I think the point you make about simplicity is absolutely correct. So it's not just about simplicity of the topic and, and where to pitch it so that the audience follows you, but I think it's also simplicity of the language that you're using and using words that are readily understandable to people who may not have English as their first language. So there's lots of aspects about pitching a talk to an audience, not just about their scientific level, but all those other aspects that you mentioned. Great. Any other questions for Professor Jane? All right. Well, thanks very much for your talk. It was excellent. I'm sure we all did great work. We're now going to move to afternoon tea, which we held outside again. Um, when we return from afternoon tea, we've got um, the exciting panel discussion on the career of a clinician scientist. Some, will, some of you will have met Professor Peter Villerman before, who's a general pedi paediatrician who leads the Barwon Infant Health Study, which is uh, one of the most important one of those studies in the world. Uh, Dr. Ella Vakinci, sitting down the front, is an endocrinologist who also spends a lot of time working with Indigenous health. Dr. Ruth Mitchell is a trainee neurosurgeon um, and it has an, it was the 2016 AMA Doctor in Training of the Year, so we'll also be able to give some great perspectives. And Dr. Ken Pang is a Clinician Scientist Fellow at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. So we hope that you all join us after the break and uh, there's some good discussion that goes on out there. Yeah, and, so, and we'll also be handing out feedback forms as you walk back in as well. Thank you.